everybody. This is Jen from Garden Jen's Journey. It is really cold and it's just the beginning part of January here, but I'm already thinking about what I'm going to be planting. Just in a few short months, I'm going to be using these containers right here to start getting some seedlings ready for the garden. Now in this toad, I only have a, a few seeds that we're going to be working on. But all of these seeds here, this is some Azuna uh, mustard. Really love this stuff. And then I have um, some other seeds in here. Um, but they're all going to be grown using the jugs that I have. Lots of Swiss chard. This does really, really well in the jug system. And then some Gallardia. Uh, flowers do really well with this system as well. But yeah, all these jugs have lots of them. And over there, I have lots of jugs. I have about uh, probably 400 jugs in here because I have quite a few strands of here. And then there's like six or seven strands along the rafters here of uh, never used jugs and jugs that I am going to be reusing uh, because they're still reusable. I will take you along with how I'm going to be doing the winter sewing this year. Um, you can find links to my other videos in the description box below. But I'm going to do things just slightly different so be sure to uh, watch and wait for when I actually start doing the winter sewing for this coming year, 2021. So as you can see, we're covered in lots and lots of snow. My garden beds are frozen and covered with snow. This is where I usually grow my lima beans and stuff is up this side here. Okay. So the fence behind me is part of our dog pen. You can see it here. And my husband's going to actually have to redo it probably either this spring or in the fall because some of the poles are starting to fall inward. Um, we have kind of a high water table here. So after a while, poles will start to shift and they need to be reset. But this is where I grow a lot of vertical plants quite easily. I mean, the fence is already here. Also, I have probably a dozen of uh, cattle panel arches that I use as my trellis system. You might have seen them in quite a few of my other videos if you've been watching. But this system right here um, works very well. It can be kind of pricey to start out. It took me five years to get as many as I have now. But once you get them up, they're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. I use uh, galvanized uh, livestock fencing. Um, you can get the ones that are called cattle panels. There's ones called hog panels. Um, you'll just have to look at the different uh, varieties. They all have uh, different things. Um, some of them have the smaller spaces. Like you see, these are uh, smaller spans. And then they go the larger spans. This is so that the animals don't get their, their feet caught when uh, you know, they don't put their feet through the bottom of the fence and then further up. But this works fine for me. I'm not too worried about the small spacing because I grow beans on my trellises more than squash. So I don't have to worry about squash getting stuck in this small hole. But beans work very, very well. One of the best things that you need to think about when planning for your garden, and right now, when there's snow on the ground, is the best time to plant. The, one of the main things you need to think about when planting your garden is how to get the most bang out of your garden space buck. Tip number one is to grow all things vertical as much as possible. So this includes beans, cucumbers, squashes and pumpkins and melons, anything that has a vine, you want to try to grow it up. This saves that precious ground space for the crops that you cannot grow up. Your root crops, uh, your brassicas, uh, lettuces, things like that, that have to stay on the ground. By growing your vine crops upwards, you have that much more space down on the ground. So it's very important to think about when planning your garden space is how to grow more things vertically 
so you can grow more things on the ground and it actually increase your overall yield for your garden. And like I said, I have lots of different fences around here um, just because we have uh, dogs and we also have chickens. Um, so we automatically have fencing because of the uh, livestock situation. We have a little small farm here, so to speak. This right here is the one side of my chicken run. Uh, we keep our chickens in an enclosed run during the winter and if we're not home uh, during the day so they stay safe from predators. But I also use it uh, for growing things like my uh, grapevine. And I'm going to have to put a little more fencing up so they don't get out because uh, they have figured out how to jump over my elderberry bush which is right behind us and get over the fence. But I'm also going to have to put some more fencing on the back side because they also eat the grapes that are growing on their fence. So you have to think about that and plan too. If you have chickens or something or uh, livestock and you're trying to grow things on their fence, you have to think about what they may or may not eat so, so you don't end up growing food for them. Unless that's what you're planning on doing, then by all means do it. But yeah, we use uh, the fencing that's already here uh, to maximize how much we can grow up without having to constantly buy more uh, cattle panel fences. The thing with cattle panel fences is they can be kind of pricey depending on where you are. Some places they're very easy to get. Uh, I live in a very rural area so because I'm in farm country we have a farm store and so it's very easy for me to get cattle panels. Now for my setup, cattle panels usually run about $20 to $30 depending on what style you get and um, if they're on sale or not. So uh, one cattle panel plus four five foot T-posts runs me about $40 total. Um, and that's on the high end of things. So I, like I said, I have about a dozen different panels uh, that make up my various arbors here. And it took me five years to get there. And if you need to, you can move them around. I mean, we, it's very easy to pull up the stakes um, and move them to somewhere else. A little bit labor intensive, but not too bad. So this is a very great investment to be able to grow more food very efficiently. Um, I grow lots and lots and lots of beans this way. I did grow quite a few squash this way, uh, but lately we've been dealing with not only the squash bugs, but the squash vine borer. So uh, this coming season, I'm going to grow probably just the delicata squash, and that'll be it. So um, it's going to be all beans. Uh, I'm going to be growing Japanese cucumber, and then uh, the delicata squash all on these trellises here. Last year this fence area here is where I grew quite a few of my tomatoes. I grew some in other parts of the garden but this was my main tomato area and one of the things I struggle with is I have a very small garden space and I really don't have an area to expand that because we live kind of on a small uh, gar uh, small land plot so to speak um, but we do the best we can. So that being said, some crops that take a lot of room to grow, like tomatoes, um, has been very, very difficult because I simply don't have the space to grow the amount of tomatoes that I need to preserve for our family for the winter, so to speak. But I do have a friend who has a very large garden area and we're going to work together to be able to grow enough tomatoes in her large garden area to feed both of our families. So that is a huge, huge load off my shoulders, a big blessing, because that means the space that I had put aside for tomatoes, I can use to grow something else, something that will take less space and give me more yield uh, for my garden, garden space. And that's another tip, that's probably tip number two I want to share with you is if you have a small garden area, and I know some of you do, you struggle with uh, maybe patios or container gardens or things like that, but you want to get the most bang for your buck, look into plants that give you the most bang for your buck. Sure, a lot of people love tomatoes, love, love, love tomatoes, but tomatoes can be quite 
space hogs, tomatoes and peppers and things like that. So grow maybe, maybe one or two tomato or pepper plants so you can have some fresh, fresh ones to eat. But think about um, other things that give you more bang for that garden space buck. If you grow lettuce, you can grow lettuce varieties like loose leaf lettuce. Those are cut and come again, meaning that you can cut them down almost to the soil line to get some fresh lettuce and let them regrow and you can come back later and cut them again. So they're a continual giving plant, which works very well for small garden spaces. So very, very uh, beneficial to think about size versus yield on your plants. Another wonderful plant to get um, in a smaller garden space are a lot of your greens. Uh, spinach does really well in the cooler months. It's also a cut and come again crop. Uh, your kale, you can either grow the big kale if you got room or the small kale and if you keep it trimmed it's a cut and come again crop as well. So you can really feed yourself in a small, pay, uh, small space by using uh, some of those crops that give a lot of yield time and time again instead of just one time use only crops. One of the other things that's very important when you're planning your garden area, basically tip number three when planning your garden area, is make sure that you have a plan in place to bring in pollinators. Now I have quite a few uh, hanging baskets and I also have quite a few garden beds that are dedicated to flowers. Yeah, people might think you're crazy growing flowers in your vegetable patch, but it's one of the best things you can do because it brings in those pollinators. It brings in those beneficial insects that will help control the bad insects. And so to, to bring those guys in, that's very, very important. Uh, I noticed last year our bee population was way, way down. We have a crop farmer way that way. Well, not too far, but just on the other side of the uh, the woods over there about half a mile away um, and they spray a lot of fertilizer pesticides herbicides you name it they're that kind of crop farmer and so uh, we're guessing that that's one of the reasons that our uh, bee population really was devastated but because I had integrated quite a few flowers into my garden bed, it brought in the other pollinators. I had tons of different varieties of butterflies. I had about four or five uh, hummingbirds come to visit. And I had some Orioles. I have not seen Orioles in my uh, area for a couple of years. Um, and last year, I actually had Orioles. So you really have to think about how to plan your garden not only for growing your vegetables, but also how to bring in those pollinators that will help you get more vegetables. So that's very, very important. Tip number four. If you can, have a dedicated space where you can plant your seedlings, up-pot them, and things like that. It's kind of important for you to have an area where you can store all that good stuff now my husband made this little garden shed for me and it looks quite weird because it's made out of pallets and tarps and so you'll see that a lot in my videos it looks really weird on the outside but it is very very spacious as far as what i can store in here and what i can work on i have this nice little rack behind me that uh, i used to do my potting right now it's discombobulated but I can do a lot of potting here. I have a lot of my supplies back here. So it works out very well to have a space that you can have to work on potting your plants. So that's tip number four. Make sure you have a space to work with um, that's out of the weather. You can come in here usually uh, when it's raining or something and still work on doing some planting uh, when I get some seedlings to pot up to sell. I have this space to do it in, so that works very, very well. Tip number five, and this is more for the northern growers. Uh, I'm zone 5B, so, but more for the no northern growers. If you struggle with growing um, tomatoes and peppers and things that really like warm temperatures and your season's just not being very warm, you might want to consider having some type of greenhouse hoop house, high tunnel, something like that, that keeps your temperatures warmer for those warm loving plants. Now, 
this greenhouse isn't anything fancy it's a harbor freight special and it's been through a lot but for growing peppers and things like that i can grow them in here and it stays warm enough that i can actually get a yield from my peppers and it doesn't have to be very big this is a six by eight greenhouse so not very big but i could fit quite a few pots in here of uh of peppers um, if i wanted to some eggplants or things like that that like warmer temperatures and need them to really produce. Um, it's great to have this area. So those are my five top tips that I would give anybody who's trying to get ready to plan for a new garden this year on how to get the best bang for your garden buck. And also a bonus tip, if you can get some live composters, AKA chickens, and we do have some causing a ruckus, that is a really good investment. Um, we're vegetarians, so we don't actually eat our chickens, but we do occasionally have their eggs um, for breakfast, or we sell their eggs in order to pay for the feed. Uh, but they do very well composting um, the garden waste and vegetable scraps from when we make food, and we get beautiful compost from them every year. So there's a bonus tip for you. Get yourself some live composters. Maybe not ones that are so rowdy though. <laughs> Thanks for watching everybody. This is Jen from Garden Jen's Journey. Hoping wherever you are that you have a blessed day. Bye-bye.